Okay, thank you very much. So it is my pleasure to introduce Ignacio Franco from the University of Rochester. Ignacio did his uh, PhD at the University of Toronto in the chemistry department, working with uh, Paul Romer. Then he uh, made a postdoc at the Northwestern University with George Schwartz and Mark uh, Ratner. And he spent some time at the uh, Fritz Haber Institute. And after that, he started working at the University of Rochester, where he is currently working. He has uh, many awards in his uh, trajectory. Uh, perhaps I can mention a couple, the Leonard, Leonard Mandel Faculty Fellow in Quantum Co Coherence of the University of Rochester. And he's also a fellow of the Humboldt, uh, of the Humboldt Foundation. Uh, and he also received the Bimesh Prize in Physical Chemistry. And today he's gonna tell us about uh, quantum coherence, tackling the, uh, the coherence challenge. Thank you very much for giving us this lecture. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. I mean, if some of you could be so kind to turn your video feeds on such that I could uh, uh, respond to verbal and nonverbal cues, uh, that would be much appreciated. I see Carlos, my friend Carlos is there. Uh, so many friendly faces. Um, I am so happy to have the opportunity to tell you about some of the work that we do in Rochester uh, investigating the coherence processes in molecules and to address this community that I know that loves quantum mechanics and quantum mechanical effects. Um, so let me, let me start by telling you a little bit about Rochester and the University of Rochester. And uh, so this is the city of Rochester. You see the city over here. This is the University of Rochester. Uh, so you see, it, it doesn't always snow in the city of Rochester. <laughs> And um, there's a river here called the Genesee River. And if you follow that river that it borders the, the university, you will get to the city. And if you keep going, you will get to Lake Ontario. And maybe that blue at the end of the, of the picture will be uh, Lake Ontario. So in a day as special as today, I, I think I like to think of this day as a Kodak moment. And in those occasions, I'd like to remind myself that uh, Rochester is actually the land of the Kodak moment in the sense that the Kodak company was developed uh, here in town. Okay, so let me start by telling you a little bit about the research that we do in Rochester in an, an overview and I will focus on the particular topic of the coherence. So we care very much about the problem, the general problem of how to control matter at the level of electrons using lasers. And when you think the pro about the problem of laser control of electrons, you have to think very carefully about the problem of the coherence. And the reason for this is because most existing laser control strategies are based on exploiting quantum interference effects. And hence the rule of thumb in quantum control is that if you lose such coherence, you will lose your control. So my group works in two directions. We develop laser control strategies that are impervious to the decoherence. And in particular, uh, we like uh, strategies based on the on the Stark effect, on the dynamic Stark effect induced by strong laser fields. And also we investigate the decoherence very carefully in the hopes that by understanding the decoherence, we will be able to either uh, figure out ways how to avoid the decoherence or take advantage of the decoherence. Now to do this, we also need to develop methods that uh, enable us to solve the time dependence of the equation or the Liouville von Neumann equation uh, for molecules in a sort of in an all different class of environments, so we develop methods for quantum dynamics. Yet another topic that is uh, very interesting but a bit less quantum uh, that is in in our group is the concept. We are very interested in problems in molecular junctions, in which one molecule is attached by its ends to macroscopic metallic contacts. And the reason why we're interested in this is because in this setup you can apply simultaneously voltages, forces. Um, and light to a single molecule, and therefore you can develop a multi-dimensional spectroscopies that operate at the single molecule limit. Okay, so um, today I would like to focus on the issue of decoherence, and maybe I know that you all uh, know this, but let me just um, uh, stress what we mean by quantum coherence. So here there are many answers, and depending on who you speak with, he will give you a different answer, he or she will give you a different answer. But the usual answer is that we mean the off-diagonal elements of the density matrix. 
And there are really two important bases. There is the energy basis, in which if you have a quantum mechanical state that is a superposition of two uh, eigen energy states, if you construct the density matrix, you see that all the dynamics is in the off-diagonal elements. So these coherences in the energy basis leads to quantum dynamics. And the way that you measure these coherences is actually through time-resolved spectroscopies, because these coherences lead to time-dependent polarizations that is a, that you can capture in, 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 in laser spectroscopies, in various laser spectroscopies. Now, another class of coherence is when you decide to express your density matrix in position-position representation. And now this type of coherence is it's a measure of sort of like quantum non-local phenomena in the sense that is you're asking the question of whether the system at X knows what is happening about the X prime. And these coherences are manifest in interference experiments and also in quantum transport experiments. Okay, so why do we care about quantum coherence? Uh, well, I mean, this community knows very well that coherence is the engine behold, behind all quantum technologies. We need it for matter to exhibit interference, control entanglement, we need it for quantum unitary operations. And all these elements are essential for quantum control, for quantum computation and quantum sensing. So, from, so we love to protect quantum computers. From a more physical chemistry perspective, a more molecular perspective, um, one of the reasons why you're interested in enhancing the coherence or the temporal coherence of matter is because they lead to enhanced laser spectroscopies. The longer the temporal coherence, the sharper your spectral features, the higher resolution that you will have in laser spectroscopy. And um, another reason why we are interested in chemistry and coherence is because through quantum coherence, we can open new routes to control reactivity or basic events such as electron transfer. Um, okay, now uh, let me remind this community that molecules are amazing, com are amazing uh, quantum systems. They're highly compact and they're quite versatile in the sense that within a single object, we have manifolds of transitions in many regions of the electromagnetic spectrums. The electronic degrees of freedom give us transitions in the UV disk. The vibrational degrees of freedom give us transitions in the infrared. The rotational transitions give us transitions in the microwave. And we also have the spin degrees of freedom. Because, there's, because of the vastness of chemical space and how good chemists are at building all sorts of molecules, we can tune the energy levels through, make it through chemical transformations. And not only that, but we can assemble that into complex architectures. So they're really quite amazing um, quantum systems. And all chemists, at least, we would love to see molecules being used in quantum technologies. And for this, we need to preserve coherence. And another reason why we want to preserve coherence is because there is a long-standing dream in chemistry um, of using coherence to enhance molecular function. And these ideas have taken different reincarnations over the years, and these are two books and one recent review that explore that direction of research. Um, the issue, of course, that we deal with is that the coherence processes that prevent molecules to exhibit, to fully exhibit its quantum mechanical features are extraordinarily fast. So this is a chart that I took from Nitsen's book in, in chemical dynamics in Kendall's phases that he took from the review by Wallens, in which they tabulate all sorts of molecular processes and the time scales of all sorts of molecular processes. And what you see is that electronic decoherence and vibrational decoherence are some of the fastest processes in molecules occurring in tens of femtoseconds for the electronic decoherence and maybe hundreds to thousands of femtoseconds for the vibrational decoherence. So they're very, very fast. And this has prevented the use of molecules in quantum technologies. Okay. So what do we mean by decoherence? Um, Okay, so let me, such that we are all in the same page, what we mean by decoherence is the loss of quantum coherence due to entanglement of a system with its environment. So in the decoherence world, what we do is that we divide our quantum universe into a system part that are the degrees of freedom that we're interested in, a bath that we don't care very much about it, we only care about the influence of the bath on the system. And the point is that when the dynamics of system plus bath the unitary dynamics of system plus bath leads to entanglement between system and bath degrees of freedom. So for example, if you start with a superposition between two states of the system, phi one and phi two, these are states of the system, that are in tensor product of some state of the bath, bath chi, upon unitary evolution of system plus bath, 
the system of bad degrees of freedom gets entangled. You get a state that looks like this, that is already entangled. And now, if you construct the density matrix of your composite system, and you trace over the bad degrees of freedom because you don't care about them, at the initial time, when there's no entanglement, you see that the state of your system is pure in the sense that there is a strong relation between the off-diagonal elements and the diagonal elements of this density matrix. If you want, the determinant of this matrix is, is zero. In, and upon time evolution, those off-diagonal elements get modulated by these bath states. And when these bath states are orthogonal, these off-diagonal elements go to zero, and you have lost your coherence and your system transition from a pure state to a mixed. So, Ignacio, yes. And there is a question about the time scales in the previous slide. Was that at room temperature, or is it also very fast for cold molecules? Um, so, temperature increases generally uh, increases the rate of decoherence. But this electronic decoherence, uh, this time scale of the electronic decoherence, e occurs even when you're at zero temperature, when you're in excited states. Okay. More questions? I, I cannot keep track of the, of the chat. I'll, I'll, I'll interrupt you if you don't mind every time there is a question. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Now, so give me an, to give you an example of, of how decoherence occurs through entanglement and how it affects your ability to exhibit your quantum mechanical features. So it's a simple example. Consider the double state experiment. So we all know this experiment and love it in, in which we have quantum particles that are impinged on a double slit and we create a superposition, say, of particle going through the upper slit and a particle going through the lower slit. Then we find, we figure out what is the probability density of detecting the particle along a screen, along a particular coordinate. And what we realize is that the probability density has three components, has two direct terms, that arise because of a particle going through one specific lit at a given position in the detection screen, x. Uh, this is the other direct term arising from the other contribution, and then an interference. And the direct terms are always positive, but these interference contributions can be positive or negative, and this leads to the interference fringes that are characteristic of this double slit experiment. Okay. So now what we do is that we, we propose a Gedanke experiment, a thought experiment, in which we now include a bath. And my bath will be some, for example, some oscillator that when the particle goes through the second slit, it excites that oscillator. And that bath has two states, zero if it's not excited and one if it's excited. So now when the particle passes through slit two, it excites the oscillator and therefore the state of the particle after passing through the slits will be a superposition of this form in which if it passed through slit one, it didn't excite the oscillator, while if it passed through slit two, it did excite the oscillator. And now this is an entangled system bath state. Now, if I calculate the probability distribution of, of the interference pattern, what I find is that the direct terms get unaffected by this entanglement, but that the interference is modulated by this overlap between the bath states. So when these bath states are orthogonal, that is when your entanglement is perfect, then you will lose that interference contribution in your double state experiment. Okay. So you, because of the coherence, you lose your ability to interfere. Okay. So the work in my group is focused on uh, addressing basic questions about uh, the coherence in molecular systems. We care about questions such as how fast is the coherence? How do we quantify the decoherence? What are the basic mechanisms behind coherent laws? How to model it and how to overcome? And what I would like to tell you about today is the work of two very talented um, um, members of my group, uh, Bung Gu, who is now at the University of California at Irvine, and Wen Shen Ku, who is finishing his PhD, and it looks like he's moving to, he's going to work for Amazon. Um, okay, and so what I would like to tell you it's about a general theory of early times decoherence time skills, something that it applies to any system bath problem, uh, to molecules specifically, but any problem that you can divide it into a system of bath. And the use of that theory to uh, develop a generalized theory of electronic decoherence. And from this theory of the electronic decoherence, we will, um, we will through this theory, we, what we will do is that we will reveal 
a way to use um, to manipulate the initial state to uh, control the rates of electronic coherence. That is, by changing the relative phases in the initial state, we will find ways to manipulate the electronic coherence. Uh, and there, and then I would like to tell you about the challenges of preparing such a state and actually through actual laser photoexcitation. So an initial theory for the coherence time skills, its specific applications to understand the electronic decoherence in molecules, and how that theory revealed novel ways to use quantum control techniques or coherent control techniques to enhance or um, prevent the electronic decoherence and the challenges in actually using lasers to enact such a theory. So that will be the, con the context of today's lecture. Um, just to give you a sense of other things that we work on decoherence, um, we have worked very hard on understanding how useful are classical noise models of decoherence. Um, we try to model the decoherence dynamics by, by including explicit dynamics of the environment. Um, we investigate entanglement in the main approximations in chemistry. Uh, we work uh, in many body problems where maybe the electronic interactions can influence the decoherence and, uh, and their connections, so we investigate such, such problems. Okay. Now, this talk will also be about discussing a surprising and rather dramatic artifact that is introduced by initial separable states. So, um, when you're doing open quantum system dynamics, many of you do open quantum system dynamics, it is customary to start with an initial separable state where this is the, this rho v is the density matrix of the environment and this sigma will be the density matrix of the system. And we need this, this is useful because it allows us to establish dynamical maps in open quantum systems and in particular, the cross operator sum representation that um, connects the density matrix at initial time with the density matrix at time t of the system. Uh, so this initially factorizable state is a useful idealization in this context, but it, and it's a reasonable approximation. So what I'm going to show you is that um, in practice, this state is an exotic state. And in the context of laser control, this uh, rather innocuous looking separable initial state will lead to a qualitatively wrong quantum control, laser control. And I will tell you then how to restore the control once you understand this. Okay, so the first question that I would like to address is um, how to quantify decoherence and how to define a decoherence time scale. And this is the work of Dr. Bingu, who is pictured right in the middle of uh, this picture of the group, which is already about two years old. Um, okay, so. When I want to quantify the coherence, I like to use this quantity called the purity. And the main idea is as follows. Consider that you have a general entangled system by state. So this Vn will be states of the system, and these um, chi Ns will be states of the bath. And this will represent a general entangled state between system and bath. You can construct the density matrix of the system by constructing the density matrix of the composite system, and then tracing out the environment uh, to give you the density matrix of the system of interest. And you, you now see that the off diagonal elements of the density matrix are modulated between these, these, these bath states, between, by the overlap of these bath states. And the point is that if your system is pure, your density matrix, you will be able to express your system as a, as a, as a, a wave function. And that means that your density matrix will be idempotent. That means that rho squared is equal to rho. And then the purity, which is obtained by taking the square of the density matrix of the system and then tracing, will be trace of rho square, which will be equal to trace of rho, which will be equal to one. So for a pure state, the purity is one. And once you have a mixed state, once you have a decay of the overlap between these environmental states, the, the density matrix will no longer be idempotent and the purity will be less than one. So this is a very simple, um, basis independent measure of decoherence and it's basis independent because it's based on the on a trace quantity and the traces are independent of the basis. Okay. The reason why purity is not, at least in, in the within the physical chemistry community, is not used often to quantify decoherence, even when it's a very clear measure of decoherence, 
is because it's a very difficult quantity to calculate and it's a very difficult quantity to experimentally isolate. And the reason for this is because when you have a general many body problem, if you want to calculate purity, you either need the density matrix of your many body system, which is generally inaccessible, or you will, or you will need the overlaps between the environmental states, which are the environment can be a, a high dimensional system and uh, this is generally inaccessible. So both from a computational perspective and from an experimental perspective, the purity, even when a very clear measure of the coherence, is computationally and experimentally removed. Okay. Wouldn't it be great if we could access to the dynamics of purity without reconstructing the density matrix for the full many body density, uh, without reconstructing the, the, the density matrix for the full many body problem? So um, this would be tremendous. And I'll tell you about one possible strategy in this direction, there might be others. So our focus, uh, I'll, what I will show you is that I will introduce a simple but general, a general but simple relation between the dynamics of purity at early times, for short times, and the fluctuations of the operators that entered into the system bath copy. So generally, I'm thinking about systems in which you have a system part, a bath part, and a system bath copy. And what I will show you is that the short time purity dynamics is determined by the fluctuations of the operators that enter into the system bath copy. It is valid for any system bath Hamiltonian with an initially pure system. There is no need to reconstruct the density matrix. It is useful to establish the coherence times for basic chemical or physical processes. And it's also useful to test approximate quantum dynamics methods. Okay, so let me, let me show you what we do. So we start with a Hamiltonian that has a system part, a bath part, and a system bath copy. We start from the Liouville von Neumann equation for system plus bath, and we suppose that that dynamics is unitary. We do a short time expansion. That means that we expand the density matrix of the composite system up to second order in time. So uh, this is the first order expansion. That's the second order expansion. And we heavy handedly neglect all terms that are higher order than the second order. We trace over the bath to get the same expansion, but for the density matrix of the system. And then we assume that we have an initially pure system. So that is, we suppose that the density matrix of the composite system is separable. The bath could have any possible density matrix, thermal or whatever, while the system will have to be a pure, will be, have to be in a pure state. I suppose that the, my system bath interaction is of this form, where this S alpha are operators in the system Hilbert space, and this B alpha are operators in the bath Hilbert space. And this is a very general form for the system bath interaction. I don't know any examples in which I cannot express it in this form. And then you take the square of the density matrix, you calculate purity, you sit there with a giant cup of coffee, and you enjoy the massive cancellation of terms. And what you get is something very, very beautiful, very, very general. What you find is that for early times, the purity, which is our quantifier of the coherence, decays like a Gaussian. And if you want, this is a manifestation of the quantum Zeno effect. So the fact that you don't have a linear component means that the bath is preventing your evolution uh, at early times. So you, the first order component will be to second order. And there's a time scale associated with that decay. And you can associate that time scale with a decoherence time scale. And how that time scale looks like is of this form, where this, this is a sum, this sum is, so this is the system bath coupling. So this sum is over the system and bath operators that enter into the system bath coupling. This is for the bath, this is for the system. And what you have is um, covariances or cross fluctuations between the bath operators and this, and and the system operators at initial time. So these averages are all at initial time, at time is equal to zero. Now, this decoherence time scale depends on fluctuations. Fluctuations are few body quantities. So in principle, these are quantities that are computationally and experimentally accessible in the sense that they're few body quantities. They do not require the full density matrix in order to get the decoherence time scale. 
and it does not invoke common approximations in open quantum systems such as Markovian dynamics, rotating wave, pure defacing, weak coupling, or harmonic bats. So it's, it's really um, a general result. Um, okay. So what is the physical, what is the physics behind this? The physics behind this is best seen when you consider only one term in the system length interaction. And the main idea, and in this case, what you see is that the discoherent time scale is related to the fluctuations of the system and bath operator at initial time. So the main thing is that the larger the fluctuations of the operator that enter into the system bath coupling initial time, the faster the decoherence. So for example, if you couple through position, the faster your fluctuations of position at initial time, the faster your decoherence. That's the main thing. I noticed that there was a, a, a question in the chat, maybe. So do you have any idea of the time scales for which that approximation is valid or worse a bit more intuition from Taudi? Okay. Can you know experimentally when this approximation fails? Okay, Carlos, you always ask all the tough questions. Let me, let me, let me go to that point in just a minute. And that's exactly my next talk. In general, we don't know the general answer of when this approximation fails. Um, this is something that we are investigating uh, right now with one of the members of my group. Uh, and, and clearly, as Carlo mentions, this early time Gaussian decay does not necessarily quantify the complete decoherence dynamics of molecular systems. In some specific cases, what people have, in, some, in a pure defacing spin boson problem, what people have shown, what I, there are calculations that indicate that this Gaussian decay is valid up to the um, cutoff frequency of the bath. No? So if you know the cutoff frequency of the bath, you will know when you go from a Gaussian decay to an exponential decay in that model. For molecules, and in particular for electronic decoherence, there are computations, exact computations, in which you follow the dynamics of both electrons and nuclei and look at the electronic purity. And what these computations seem to suggest is that there are instances in which that period, that initial Gaussian decay actually dominates the dynamics. Um, there are also similar arguments for vibrational decoherence. But right now, it's, a, it's an open question. You know, uh, to what extent this is, a, this is of general applicability. It will capture the early time. And the supposition is that when, you, when this early time changes depends on the frequencies of the environment that you're dealing with. Now, let me show you one way in which you can use this quantum, this, this decoherence time scale. So you can use it to test approximate quantum dynamics methods. So typically, if you want to solve a problem in which you have a system and an environment, it, typically you are not able to solve this fully quantum mechanically because capturing the dynamics of both system and the environment is something that um, fully quantum mechanically, it's something that is challenging for present day quantum, uh, for present day computational resources. Uh, so you recur, you actually do approximations and one basic approximation uh, that, it, that is often used is that you consider the dynamics of the environment classically. So your system will evolve quantumly while your bath will evolve classically and you mimic the decoherence by doing ensembles of mixed quantum classical trajectories and then taking the ensemble averages. And the question is to what extent these mixed quantum classical schemes capture the decoherence correctly. So we don't know the answer to that question to all extents, but you, we can give an, an initial answer at the short times. So what you can do is that you can write down equations of motion for mixed quantum classical systems in very generic terms, and you can repeat the analysis that I just described for the fully quantum term for the fully quantum system, but for the mixed quantum classical case. And you can develop a decoherence time scale for the mixed quantum classical case that looks like this. And you see, it's sort of, it's identical to the fully, fully quantum. This is supposed to be quantum, not quantum classical. This is the fully quantum, this is the quantum classical. But the only difference is that for the classical environment, instead of having a quantum expectation value of the covariance of the bath operators, what you have is an average over the initial ensemble. And the main thing is that if your, if your initial ensemble of classical initial conditions can mimic the relevant quantum fluctuations, then your mixed quantum classical analysis will get the decoherence correctly. So for example, if you couple through position or through momentum to the environment and you use your initial Wigner state uh, for the quantum mechanical system as a way to 
sampled the initial conditions for your mixed quantum classical analysis, you will be able to capture the decoherence, uh, the early can decoherence of your fully quantum system exactly. So for example, these were computations that were done by Wen Shen Hu, in which he shows purity as a function of time and the, in the early times, and the exact one would be the black one, and the other ones are all mixed quantum classical approximations, and you see that they are excellent approximations to the full quantum dynamics for early times. For longer times, they are not so very good, not very good approximations, but for early times, they are. Okay. Now, once you have this formula, you can use it to develop the coherence time skills. So once, just in a couple of lines, you can recover the result by Presto and Roski for electronic decoherence for, for the spin boson problem. You can recover just in a couple of lines the result by Kim and Borges developing decoherence time skills for the caldera legged model. And you can, all, you can use it to develop decoherence time skills for new models. And in particular, we developed it for the Holstein Hamiltonian, which is a basic model for vibronic interactions. And you can do this without doing dynamics or finding the many body state. Now, what I would like to focus on is how we use that theory of electronic decoherence to, it's that theory of uh, decoherence time skills to develop a generalized theory of electronic decoherence in molecules and the consequences of doing that generalization. So the system in this case will be the electrons in molecules while our bath will be the nuclear degrees of freedom. And it's the electron nuclear interactions what lead to electron nuclear entanglement and to electronic decoherence. Out of all the nuclear degrees of freedom in, um, in molecular systems, vibrations, torsions, and solvent, the most important ones by far are the vibrational degrees of freedom since they are the, most, they are the ones that are strongly coupled and they're the ones that are fast. The reason why we're interested in electronic decoherence is because um, we want to protect the coherence pro properties of electrons for quantum technologies, and in particular, in our case, in our, the case of our group for laser control of electrons, but also because it's a basic feature of correlated electronuclear states. It's central to understanding vital processes such as photosynthesis, ambition, and electron transfer. And uh, this, is a, this, this reason is something that is very important in theoretical chemistry. It's, in, it's, in, it's important to develop approximate schemes to, to follow the electron vibration of evolution of molecules. Okay, so let me translate these ideas of the coherence through entanglement in the context of molecules or molecular systems. So this is energy. Here are nuclear coordinates. These are many dimensional systems. This may be a potentially surface, say for the ground electronic state. This may be a potential surface for a first excited electronic state. This may be the potential surface for a, a second excited electronic state. Now, you can start with a vibrational wave packet, a nuclear wave packet in a given uh, electronic, uh, in, associated with a given electronic state. And you can come in with a very short laser pulse. And what that laser pulse is that it creates an exact replica of this nuclear wave packet in the excited state potential surface. And by doing that, you're creating a state that sort of looks like this, in which you are creating a superposition between the ground state and the first excited electronic state with the same nuclear wave packet in both states. So it's a state that is on in, approximately unentangled. And then upon time evolution, this wave packet will move in that high dimensional potentially surface. A, and then it will lead to entanglement between electrons and nuclear. You will get states that look like this. If you, ca if you trace out the nuclear degrees of freedom because you don't care about them and you just focus on the electronic density matrix, for this initial state, what you find is that your initial density matrix is pure in the sense that these off-diagonal elements uh, have a strong relation with the diagonal elements of the density matrix. But upon time evolution, these electronic coherences um, get modulated by these bad states, by these nuclear bad states, by these nuclear overlaps. So if these nuclear overlaps decay, then you lose your electronic coherence. So the basic idea in understanding electronic decoherence in molecules is that it arises because of nuclear wave packet overlap, because of the decay of nuclear wave packet overlap due to the dynamics of nuclear wave packets in alternative electronic potential surfaces. 
And these are ideas that have been in the chemistry literature for around 25 years or so. Okay, so now to proceed, I need to introduce the Hamiltonian for a two surface molecular Hamiltonian. So molecules have many electronic surfaces. I'm going to consider only two of them, the ground state and the first excited state, each one of them will have a given potentially surface, Vg and Ve. And the nuclear, sorry, the electron nuclear Hamiltonian sort of looks like this. This is the ground electronic state, and this is the nuclear Hamiltonian associated with that ground electronic state. This is the first excited electronic state, and this is the nuclear Hamiltonian associated with that first excited electronic excited state. And these are what are called diabatic electronuclear couplings. So these, these couplings here, what they do is that the nuclear dynamics induces transitions between the ground and the excited electronic state. Okay? This is what they do. While these, these, these terms here, what they do is just dynamics of the nuclear work packet in a given potential surface. surface. Okay? Now, you can massage these terms and a little bit and you can extract an identity in the electronic salt space and now you can express this component in terms of an energy gap operator, where this is the difference of the nuclear Hamiltonian in the excited state and in the ground state. And now you can see that this is a type of interaction that of the ones that we need to apply that theory of decoherence time scales, because this is a system operator and that's a bath operator, and this is a system operator and that's a bath operator. This term here does not lead to transitions between the electronic states. So this is what is called a pure defacing component. While these other terms, uh, they lead to electronic transitions and this will ultimately lead to electronic relaxation in, through the electron nuclear interaction. So this is the pure defacing and this is the non pure defacing. And each of these terms would lead to a different contribution to the time scales of electron and decoherence. So you start with a superposition of electronic superposition between the ground state and the first excited state in terms of product with some nuclear uh, wave function. You apply that theory of electronic decoherence and what you find are three components. One, um, due to the fluctuations of the energy gap, this is what we call the pure defacing component that arises because of that term in the system bath interaction that does not lead to electronic transitions. Then, there's a second term that arises because of the fluctuations of the diabatic couplings that lead to electronic transitions. And then there is the interference. And if you want, if you're familiar with block models, these pure defacing components will be like a T2. You know? These ones that arises because of transitions will be like a T1. And what this theory shows is that these two processes are not independent, but they can actually interfere and there's a cross coupling between them, which is this interference. Now, um, how accurate is the theory? So we contrasted the predictions of the theory of the coherence time scale, uh, which are shown in, with the dashed lines, with a numerically exact simulations in the context of a displaced harmonic oscillator at different temperatures. These are actually high temperatures. Um, and which are shown by the solid lines. And what you see is that the theory of the coherence time scales get the initial Gaussian decay quite accurately, but the actual full quantum dynamics, we get a partial recurrence in the purity. So you see it decays like a Gaussian and then you get a recurrence. And this is the type of thing that this Gaussian decay doesn't quite properly get. Okay. But it's in reasonable agreement with exact numerical computations for this model. Now, the other thing that we learned here uh, is that you see there are these terms here that depend on this quantity theta. And what we mean by theta is really the relative phase between the grounds, between this coefficient in the ground state and this coefficient in the excited state. So that is this product, you can express it as their magnitudes and then a relative phase between them. And what this tells you is that whenever you have this component, these electronic transitions, a by changing, just by changing the phase of your initial superposition, of your initial electronic superposition, you can either make the decoherence go faster or go slower. You can, just by changing uh, initial phases, you can mitigate or enhance the decoherence. And it really requires uh, these non-zero fluctuations in these electron-nuclear couplings 
And molecular terms for you, those of you that are familiar with molecular Hamiltonians, what you require is something that is called a conical intersection. So we were very intrigued by this because essentially until then, this meant that we could use coherent control techniques to manipulate electronegative coherence. And this was something that I thought it was previously impossible. Uh, but when you had these two components, both the pure defacing and the electronic transitions, the interference and the contributions of the electronic transitions open these opportunities. And sure enough, uh, maybe four months after we published this paper, um, the group, actually, as we were working on sim similar simulations, the work of Arnold Vandrell, Welsh, and Santra published a paper in which uh, what they showed is that uh, whenever you had these conical intersections in a molecular systems, um, just by changing the phase of, the relative, of, 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 of your initial electronic superposition, um, you can change it, the decoherence, the rate of decoherence. So this is purity as a function of time, this is purity as a function of time, and you see that just the, the dynamics for, purity, for a relative phase of pi halves or a relative phase of zero is completely different you know, in the presence of these conical intersections. So, um, that was great, but now the challenge um, was how to actually construct such states. So if you're able to construct these states in which you're in a superposition between the ground electronic state, the first excited electronic state in tensor product with some nuclear state, and you can control this phase, then you will be able to, um, you will be able to control the rate of electronic decoherence. Okay, so with when, um, we started to think about how we could we use, how could we generate such states through actual laser photoexcitation, because this is the main method that we have to prepare quantum mechanical states in molecular, in molecular systems. Okay, so our idea was very, very simple. We started with uh, initially separable state for the ground state, where this is the ground electronic state, and this is the nuclear wave packet associated with the ground electronic state, so something like this. And we come in, the, laser, the later, the, la the latest advances in, 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 in laser, in, in the development of laser sources allow you to create pulses with just a few cycles. So it will be like a short envelope, uh, a cosine of omega t, and you can control this phase, this absolute phase that is called the carrier envelope phase. So the main idea is that this laser pulse can induce impulsive photoexcitation in the sense that it can create this wave packet, and it's so fast that effectively what it does is that it creates an exact replica of that wave packet in the excited state potentially surface. And in the process of photoexcitation, what happens is that you pick a phase from the laser field. And you can see this from first order perturbation theory. And it, so that means that the relative phase between the ground state and the first excited state, we can manipulate by varying the carry envelope phase of the incident laser field. Okay, so this is what we did. Um, and what Gwen showed, in, this is the model for photoisomerization. This is my ground state in blue. This, the, the green one will be the excited state. Is that if you do that process, and these are numerically exact computations, and you follow the purity, and you vary that carry envelope phase of the laser pulse, basically just by changing the carry envelope phase, you can change the rate of the coherence of coherence loss. Okay. So this meant that there was a possibility of using a coherent control techniques to control electronic coherence. We were very excited about this. Now, then we did a very, very small change, a minute change. Instead of using, so we were using a separable electron nuclear state. This is an electronic system. This is the nuclear component. We were using a separable electron nuclear state. And then we did a very, very small change, which instead of using this model separable state, we use the true ground state for this problem. And I'm saying that it's a small change in the sense that the separable state is an excellent approximation to the true ground state with a fidelity of 0.9942, no? so 99.4% accurate. Okay. And we repeated this process of doing the laser photoexcitation. And what we observe is that now in that case, this is the purity as a function of time, a, and we change the relative phase, and basically all laser control goes away. Yeah. A, bearing the relative phase has no influence on the laser uh, dynamics, in the laser-induced dynamics. So that is to say, the initially factorizable state that we love so much actually leads to a spurious laser control of the coherence, 
even when it's an excellent approximation to the true grounds. Um, okay, what is going on? The way to understand this, to understand this, is actually useful to view the process not in the eigenbasis of the system, but in the eigenbasis of the composite electrons plus nuclear system. So when you start in the ground state, uh, you will start, this is the ground state of the composite system, you will photo excite the system, and in that process, what you do is that you transfer populations from your ground state to your first excited state, and you pick up a phase. And that phase is the laser phase, the, car the carry envelope phase. So now you create a superposition that sort of looks like this, where this is my ground state, and this will be my, the population that I put in the excited state with that carry envelope phase that I picked from my laser field. And now, if I look at the population of the ground state and the, and, the, and the first excited state, I just take these coefficients and do the modulo square, and I see that those populations are independent of the carry envelope phase. Now, for reasons that are longer for me to explain, the average purity is dependent on the eigenstates of the populations. And because the eigenstate populations are independent of the carry envelope phase, the electronic purity will also be independent of the carry envelope phase. Now, if instead of using a separable state, if instead of using an eigenstate of the composite system, I start with a separable state, when I express it in the eigenbasis of the composite system, that separable state is not stationary, and that means that it will be a, a superposition of eigenstates of the composite system, something like that looks like this. Uh, this is a superposition, say, of the ground state and the first excited state. I photo excite, and in that process, I, I go from E0 to E1, and I pick up a phase, and this is this, is this component, um, uh, sorry, that is this component here. And I go from the first excited state to the ground state, and I pick up a phase with the opposite sign, and this is this component here. And now, if I look at the eigenstate populations, that if I take these amplitudes and take the modulo square, now I see that the eigenstate populations are dependent on the carrier envelope phase, and because this electronic purity depends on these eigenstate populations, the electronic purity will depend on the carry envelope. Okay. Now, um, now, for those of you that are quantum control aficionados, um, you may be asking whether this is no one photon coherent control. Uh, so there's a general theory in the theory of coherent control of quantum control that says that one photon coherent control is not possible. And the conditions for that, for that process to happen is that the observable that you're using commutes with the Hamiltonian, that your system is prepared in a stationary state and that your observable has no intrinsic time dependence. So I just want to say that the conditions that we are observing are beyond the applicability of the theorem because our observable is the electronic density matrix. This is what we calculate when you're calculating purity. And the density matrix does not commute with the Hamiltonian and further, it has an intrinsic time dependence. So it's something else. Now, at this point, we were wondering whether coherent control of electronic decoherence is still possible. So it is possible, and the way that we did this is by um, using a two-pole scheme, in which a first few cycle laser pulse creates a superposition, say, between the ground state and the first excited state, while a second pulse, the pulse superposition that we need, the second pulse generates the interference that required to control the electronic purity. And this is in fact what Wen showed. This is the purity as a function of time for these two pulse excitations. And these are for se different separations. So for example, this one is for 143 femtoseconds. This is my first photo excitation. There's no dependence on purity on the phases. And then I come in with a second laser pulse that interferes with the superposition that I generated. And now I see a purity dynamics that depends very strongly on the carry envelope phase that I use. You know? And uh, this is when the separation is zero, this is the preparation is four, 143, 223 femtoseconds. And eventually uh, this will no longer work up to a certain point. Okay, so let me conclude. Uh, I introduced a general and simple relation for early time decoherence time scales. What this relation shows is that the purity decays like a Gaussian and that the rate of decay is determined by the initial quantum fluctuations of the operators that couple the system on back. It captures, this relation captures the early time decoherence dynamics without reconstructing the system many body density metrics. And it's a universal result in the sense that it doesn't require the usual approximations in quantum systems, such as Markovian dynamics, harmonic environments, and so on and so forth. 
weak, weak system bus coupling and so on and so forth. It is useful to test approximate quantum dynamics methods and in particular I showed you that for early times mixed quantum classical approaches reproduce the early time decoherence exactly when the classical distribution of initial conditions mimic the quantum fluctuation. We, this theory is useful to develop decoherence time skills and in particular I showed you how could we use this theory to develop a generalized theory of electronic decoherence and this theory captures the contributions due to pure defacing dynamics, relaxation, and also the interference to purity decay. And what was very interesting about this theory is that it revealed a novel route to use coherent control techniques um, to influence electronic decoherence when both pure defacing and electronic transitions are simultaneously at play. Now, such control requires creating superposition states of this form, which are a tensor product between the environmental states and the system states, and the system states being in a superposition with well-defined phases. And what I argued is that um, this initially, I mean, I showed you that you could create, a, that if you started with a separable state, you could use few cycle laser pulses to create such superpositions, but that actually the control um, that we observed was a spurious consequence of the fact that um, the initial state was initially separable. Um, so this is an artifact introduced by initially separable states, even when they are excellent approximations to the stationary states with fidelities above ninety nine percent. And in understanding that process, we actually developed a two pulse coherent control scheme that allows controlling the electronic purity through laser pulses. Okay. And with that, um, I thank you all for your attention. I'll be happy to receive questions. And let me finish this by bringing you um, maybe what is this? Twenty years ago. Uh, Carlos, I think you will be excited to look at this picture. So this is in Rio Grande. We are on top of the Rio Grande somewhere in New Mexico in the summer of 2002. And you may recognize some of the people in this picture. This is me when I was very young. This is Carlos when he had lots of hair. No? Uh, this is Gerardo Chowell, another Mexican in, who is now at Georgia State, a very, very accomplished person. Uh, yeah. So thank you so much for the invitation and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much for the great talk. It was very interesting. So uh, we have time for questions. There is always a little bit of a delay before people start posting questions. So let's... Yes, I'm going to open the mics uh, of ah, sure. everybody. Yeah. So in the so, meantime, let, let me start with a question then. Okay. <laughs> Go. Uh, uh, you started with a motivation showing the double slit uh, experiment of an atom that goes through the slit and you, you try to see the interference. And you can repeat this experiment with uh, things that are bigger and bigger and bigger going into diatomic molecules and bigger things like, like people have done, right? So my, my question is, whenever you go to these bigger systems, usually the decoherence starts to, to get lost. So taking what you have found, what would be your answer as to why the coherence starts to de decrease once you go to uh, bigger objects? So the magnitude in the interference decreases uh, as you go to bigger objects, but this is not necessarily related to the coherence but it's related to the fact that the, the Bruegel wavelength of bigger objects is increasingly small. And then the visibility of the interferences um, is related to the, the Bruegel wavelength. So if you keep your apparatus intact, but you decrease your De Bruegel wavelength, uh, the features in your interference experiments become closer and closer and closer and closer together. And there will be a point in which just a little bit of jittering of your experimental apparatus will wash out the decoherence correctness. So that actually is a great, when you study problems of quantum classical correspondence, um, that is a great example to always think that the transition from quantum mechanics to classical mechanics, it's uh, going to larger masses, no? smaller Debrugic wavelengths, and just a tiny little bit of noise. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with uh, internal vibrations or rotations of the molecule that introduce more levels and then de decrease the visibility? Not necessarily so. There, there, it has to do with the, the Bruegel wavelength. 
There are also experiments in which they, um, they, they excite internal degrees of freedom. And now you can create these entangled states between the wave packet that interferes with, that impinges in the, in, in the double state and then interferes with internal degrees of freedom. And then in principle, if you look, there are experiments in which you look at what is happening and internal degrees of freedom, if that tells you something about which path the particle is, telling, is going through, then you will destroy the decoder Higgs. No? Um, there are also examples, for example, of experiments in which they heat up fullerenes and they see um, that the heating up of the fullerenes decreases uh, your interference, but this is more because you are introducing noise. No? You're, you're introducing more and more noise. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. More questions? Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ignacio, for, for the talk and for accepting our invitation. I'm going to post my email because I see that we have students and people from outside the division. I'm going to uh, put my email address in case you want to have information from, for our next seminar. And I'm going to open the mics. So if you want to make, ask a question directly, so everybody's on mute, so you can interact if you want and, and english or spanish is español inglés está bien english or spanish is fine so questions guys perdón pero talk? una pregunta para para Gina. con ah, el correo que nos que nos acaba de publicar le uh -huh. escribimos nosotros para poder recibir información de los siguientes seminarios claro sí 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 mándame sí. un correo para ya para tenerte en la lista sale nada más mándame Perfecto. tu nombre completo adscripción y si eres estudiante y ya con eso claro muchas gracias de nada carlos conversa un poco bueno vamos a preguntarle algo a nacho no sé si ahí, ahí me escucha ignacio sí aquí estamos aquí estamos venga usted se enfocó mucho en, 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 en una sola partícula no en un solo electrón que pues obviamente es, el, es, es un punto pues, eh, importante. ¿Qué pasa cuando o sea, están pensando en ir a, a más partículas o, o realmente el interés por algún motivo en química es de un solo electrón? No, el, el, aquí no estaba enfocado en un solo electrón, sino en sistemas de muchos cuerpos compuestos electrónicamente. Eso nunca, eso nunca está enfocado en un solo electrón. No lo estoy oyendo, Carlos. No estoy oyendo. Carlos, espera. Tiene que quitarse el mute. Sí, ya todos están en mute. Eh, bueno, en total, el, esos, esos resultados no son para los sistemas de un solo electrón, sino para sistemas de muchos electrones. Cuando uno pasa de muchos electrones, so, let, me go, let me switch to English, because eh, so the results are not based on um, Single, uh, single particles, but on many body systems. No? So these are the core of the results. When you go from many body systems to single particles, to single, single electron systems, that is when you're not only tracing the, um, the nuclear degrees of freedom, but you're also tracing n minus one electronic coordinates, there are a different source of apparent electronic uh, decoherence that arises because of an, uh, of the entanglement of the electrons with the other electrons that arises because of electronic correlations. So at that point, when you focus on single particle quantities, it is very challenging to distinguish effects that come from the coherence due to interaction with the nuclear degrees of freedom to um, other sources of apparent decoherence that arises because of electronic correlations. Okay. Carlos, ya, ya puedes, quítate el mute tú. Yo ya te di permiso. Ah, ya, perdón, es que no Ahí. sé por qué a veces creo que funciona el unmute y listo, va, está bien, muchas gracias. Y muy padre la, la charla y, y bueno, rico, rico escucharlo después de tantos, tantos años. De tantos años. Carlos y yo somos amigos desde que estamos en, la, en el colegio, yo creo. Sí, era lo que me estaba contando, ¿qué? Que desde los 18. Más o menos, sí. A ver, ¿alguien más que quiera hacer alguna otra pregunta? Levante la mano sí. si es que no puede desconectarse. Yo, Gina. Ah, ok. ¿Dónde? <risa> ya, sí, te escuchamos. Dale. Uh, yo creo que perdí alguna parte en la plática porque 
me, me es difícil entender cómo se relaciona el concepto clásico del medio ambiente en el sentido de que uh, la decoherencia viene como consecuencia de la resonancia que hay entre la, la frecuencia propia del baño y un ancho de banda alrededor con el sistema que uno estudia. Sin embargo, el concepto de clásico tiene por otro lado. Uh, por ejemplo, eh, en el sentido de estándar, cuando uno quiere deducir las ecuaciones del Limblan, uno incluso puede tomar un baño de, en temperatura cero, que eso para nada es clásico. Sí, ¿Cómo logran hacer esta, que esta aproximación funcione? O si necesariamente en este caso estándar tendría que ser algo a temperatura alta para que jale. Bueno, ok. A ver, creo que el, lo que pasa es que la dinámica, o sea, hay dos cosas, José Luis. Hay, do, hay dos partes de tu pregunta. Sí. Eh, la dinámica clásica, la dinámica cuántica, eso se ve bien claro desde la teoría de Wigner, eh, de, 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 de la, desde la formulación de Wigner de mecánica cuántica. La dinámica cuántica es dinámica clásica más correcciones cuánticas. ¿cierto? Uh -huh. Entonces, si yo tengo un estado inicial que, me, que se asemeja, clásico que, hace, que, me, que se asemeja al estado cuántico, y trunco todas las correcciones cuánticas en la dinámica, solamente incorporo las correcciones, la parte clásica, lo que va a pasar es que mi dinámica clásica te va a capturar la de coherencia cuántica por tiempos cortos. ¿no? Después, esa dinámica va a fallar y después de tiempos cortos ya no te va a funcionar. ¿no? Ajá. Tienes razón, porque yo estoy, 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 eh, estoy eh, haciendo trampa, ¿cierto? generando de coherencia aparente, creando un ensamble de trayectorias clásico cuántico. De ahí hay otra parte de tu pregunta, que es, más, es aún más profunda. La primera ya era muy profunda. La, la otra parte de tu pregunta es esta. Listo. Entendemos que la decoherencia ocurre por entrelazamiento entre sistema y baño. ¿sí? Y ahora, ¿por qué es que yo puedo entender la decoherencia? ¿Por qué muchas veces entiendo la decoherencia ocurriendo por un baño que introduce ruido? Que es, total, por, es decir, ¿por qué lo puedo entender como, como ruido clásico? Bueno, entonces resulta que en, en general esas dos cosas no son idénticas, ¿no? Pero, cuando, pero uno puede crear ruidos que asemejen el comportamiento cuántico. Entonces, por ejemplo, cuando uno está interesado solamente en pure defacing, eh, y tienes modelos sencillos para la interacción radiación-baño, la interacción sistema-baño, ese tipo de, 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 de coherencia se puede, se puede capturar por eh, ruido que, que, tenga, que esté exponencialmente correlacionado. ¿no? Color noise, ruido coloreado. ¿no? Ajá. Lo que no pueden hacer los baños clásicos, definitivamente, es que en los baños cuánticos tú tienes... Eh, eh, decaimiento debido a eh, fluctuaciones espontáneas, ¿no? por ejemplo, emitiendo fotones o emitiendo fonones, y eso nunca lo puedes capturar con un baño cuántico. Con un baño clásico. Si lo, lo necesitas un baño, un baño cuántico. Sí, muy bien, gracias. ¿Alguien más? ¿Alguna otra pregunta? ¿Algún saludo? ¿Algo, muchachos? ¿Nadie? ¿Anybody? Bueno, bueno yo tendría English? una pregunta más. Dale. Bueno, uh, uh, en el sentido de si dentro de los, los esquemas químicos que, que manejan, ¿no están interesados también en la rotación de las moléculas? Um, ¿No es como punto importante dentro de, no, no sé, de los temas estándar que, que trabajas? La rotación de moléculas, sí, es un tema interesante y hay muchos esquemas de control para rotación de moléculas. ¿no? Eh, casi todos de ellos se, se basan en tener una molécula que tenga un dipolo neto, usar un pulso muy intenso, de manera tal que alinea la molécula con, con, con el, el campo eléctrico. El campo eléctrico. Y después uno apaga ese pulso de una y crea una superposición de estados rotacionales que puede controlar 
O sea, eso también son técnicas que están muy bien desarrolladas. En, en mi grupo no trabajamos, es, no trabajamos ese tópico porque estamos más enfocados en control de electrones. Ese es más el enfoque de, de, del grupo Rose. Oh, de acuerdo, gracias. Pero conocemos bien la literatura. Ok, ¿alguien más? ¿Nadie? Bueno, muchísimas gracias a todos. Me encantó poder hablar con esta comunidad. Eh, me encantó eh, comunicarme con mis eh, amigos mexicanos, ¿cierto? Eh, siempre los consideramos tan cercanos. Bueno, pues.